All right, good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and welcome to Kingdom Dynamics. I'm so uh, happy with this program. This program has been running now for about five years, and uh, I think this December the 29th will be five years since I started broadcasting. And so uh, I'm just grateful that God has given us a platform. Uh, you know, even today, I uh, wrote Facebook and told them how much I appreciate them um, because, you know, whether they realize it or not, they've given us the opportunity to preach the gospel around the world and to mm. unveil Christ to others. And so I'm extremely grateful for them. Uh, good to see my wife, Dr. Faye, with us tonight. Good to see one of our students from WBSU, Linda Routley, uh, joining us and others are already joining us. So tonight, my guest is Apostle Joshua Hart. Now, let me tell you a little bit about um, Apostle Josh, he has, uh, Dr. Michael Porter had taken a break uh, from Tuesday nights for until uh, the end of the year, and Apostle Josh has stepped in and, and helped us out, and it's really, really, really been great. So this is my first opportunity to have him alone uh, in the uh, the way that things flow with Kingdom Dynamics. I'm not going to try to tell you uh, where he is from in terms of these names that I cannot pronounce, but I'll, I will tell you that he is a First Nations Australian, um, uh, and he's a part of a, a clan. We, we call them uh, clans or groups in the north and central western region, uh, regional area of Queen. Queensland, Australia. And, and I'll just tell you just a little bit about him. I don't want to go over his bio too much because I posted it and uh, you had an opportunity to read it because I advertise Kingdom Dynamics, Dynamics heavily. But um, he grew up in church. Both of his parents were pastors. And even in time, uh, he became a pastor and uh, currently is in transition um, uh, I, I hear him say that he's waiting for the next assignment uh, that God has for him, but I, but I think he's in an assignment, uh, just the fact that he's always doing something that's releasing the, the God energy into people, because I'll tell you what, he works in the, the com in community service, uh, the sector of what we call uh, a drug and alcohol, family violence, uh, di diversion programs, uh, youth justice, youth pathways, and that sort of thing, and you know, just like our own professor, Apostle Jermaine Thomas, uh, works in a very similar field here in the USA. Uh, it's an opportunity to release God's love every time uh, you are ministering to someone, even if they don't know it's ministry, uh, ministry can be released. So uh, as we get into this show tonight, I just want to say, uh, Apostle Josh, welcome to Kingdom Dynamics. It's so great to have you, my brother. Amen, my brother. It's good to be here, Bishop. Um, it's good to be on Kingdom Dynamics. Um, yeah, uh, I come from Northwest Queensland, um, Kalkadoon, Mitakuri, Wonkamadra, and Pitta Pitta uh, nations. Um, this, Australia is made up of many nations. Um, and just uh, from my cultural background, being First Nations or Aboriginal, um, yeah, we, we have a real, uh, a, a, like a real, sort of um, good connection and understanding of kingdom um, mm -hmm. because of the way our culture is and the way it's set up. And so, yeah, it's good to be here. I appreciate um, being here and uh, really get, enjoying uh, getting to know you and, and, and others, Apostle Germain, Dr. Cindy yeah. um, and others. Yeah, it's been a yeah. blessing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I have certainly enjoyed the insights that you've been able to share with us. And, you know, tonight uh, we are going to talk about life in God's garden. Now, we really didn't uh, set on a title, and that's kind of what I came up with because, um, you know, as I was advertising this show, I uh, the three times that I advertise it to uh, as a prelude to uh, coming on, um, I always say a little bit different each time just to try to get people's attention uh, because, I mean, it's obvious that uh, sitting in a church on a Sunday morning and two people show up 
uh, mm -hmm. and you're not live streaming, it's it's kind of like, you know, where where's the people? Because I have this burning desire in me to share the gospel, share this revelation. But, you know, even if we share with one, uh, that's cool. But, um, you know, I really enjoy that a lot of people mm -hmm. join us from around the world. And I've been privileged to have people literally from around the world uh, on. And so I'm grateful for you uh, as you share uh, your culture, you share your heart that has been uh, fine-tuned by your uh, uh, surroundings, but not only that, by the kingdom of God within you. And, mm -hmm. and so here's what I said. I said, if life today were maintained in a type of Garden of Eden, what do we think that would be like? And I just asked people this question, can you imagine what kind of garden the Lord would have? You know, when we think about the garden of God, we always think about the garden of Eden. And we're going to talk about the garden of Eden tonight uh, from Genesis 2, 8 and probably 9. Uh, but here's the thing about it. Uh, a lot of people, you know, when I made the ad tonight, I put um, uh, this, uh, this jungle looking, you know, gardenish type thing. <laughs> And I couldn't come up with a better picture because the pictures that Facebook uh, allows is limited. But but the thing is, that's what a lot of people think about the garden. Um, and instead of stepping uh, sidestepping the the flowery, fruitful garden view, and sidestepping that and going right for Father God, and that's really the garden. But let me just read this real quick because I want to get you talking about this. Genesis 2, verse 8 and 9, and I want to start, I have several translations, but I want to start with the Amplified Bible. It says, and the Lord God planted a garden, and he, they preface this by saying, oasis in the east, in Eden, delight, uh, land of happiness, and he put the man whom he had formed or created there. And in that garden, the Lord God caused, uh, caused to grow from the ground every tree that is desirable and pleasing to the sight and good, suitable, pleasant uh, for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge, experiential knowledge, re uh, recognition of the or recognition of the difference between good and evil. And so, you know, one of the first things that we said uh, as we were talking, and, and I don't know how far we got in our conversation, but is that the garden symbolizes productivity. When you look at the Greek and different commentaries, it, it's uh, productivity in producing or being uh, a fruit bearing or bearing fruit. And right. I know that God had original design uh, before, you know, this was right after all the billions of spirit beings were cre created and released out of the father, uh, not uh, out of him as apart from him, but, but in him. And, and the first form of what we could call a human being, because that's what man is, is the species known as uh, hu a human being or as mankind. And God had original design. Uh, and one of the things I, that you said was that it was a meeting place where God and man could meet face to face. So what is the garden of the Lord and how does it relate to us today? What, what do you see in this? Amen. Well, I, I, I see it from a place where like we were originally like, um, and we've always been, you know, when I say originally, it's just that the mind of duality, um, makes it look that way that there wasn't there was uh an origin in the experience uh, but the that experience is through uh, is being um i guess unpacked through the the realm of appearance mm -hmm. uh, we we fell out of this reality of oneness and you know the picture i have in my head is like a piano accordion mm -hmm. as when it's together you know it's 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 one but when it it's we sort of fell out of it in in Adam into this. Uh, it's like when you knock your head, you start to see double. And uh, uh, there's the the realm then be, um, becomes a realm of duality, uh, but it has never changed the reality uh, of oneness, the reality that we were always in Him, and that we never lost that. You know, it stops becoming a sum even when He's in a pig pen. You know. He comes to a, a state of realization that he's always been a son um, 
in various times and seasons of his life, you know, uh, through it, through the the I guess the human experience. Um, so, you know, uh, this double vision or this piano accordion sort of falling out, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, it's it, it it be like in our I guess our earthly walk, it it sort of falls out, but then in our uh, meeting with Jesus at the cross, as he's got his arms out on the cross, it's, it's almost like he's bringing everything back together for us. It, it's, it's in that picture that it, we, it starts to make sense for us. So that's the beginning of the journey back into, back into oneness. It begins with the garden and it ends with the garden. Genesis to Revelations. And, and the, thing, the thing is, you know, even though there may have been a physical manifestation of a garden or literal, whatever, you know, with this tree, physical trees and such, the, uh, the essence of that, the, the garden is that which abides within in, in the internal realm, which is, and we're, we're going to have a look at that today about what this, what this garden is and, and understand that a little bit more. Genesis 20, so Genesis 1, 28 uh, is, you know, the mandate that was given to Adam, you know, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth with what? Fruit. Um, subdue it and have dominion, you know, and, and so there's this mandate of, of filling the earth, you know, not only, uh, uh, and uh, it's for me, it's not only the physical earth or there, there will be, you know, there are physical expressions, but for me, it's, it's us. There's got to be a fruit that's got to flow out of us. Um, when Adam hit his head, if I can say it like that, and he oh, got done. Yes. Yeah, um, the, the, his knee jerk reaction was this to cover up. Mm -hmm. So to cover up this, um, this, this, uh, I guess this this fall, or if you, if you like, this amnesia or this double vision, and it's in the covering up. You know, we we create structures, we create systems, we create, um, uh, I guess, uh, worlds um, that tr that make sense of the way that we experience the world. I guess, and so what? But God is always wanting us to get back to. Um, back to this or the origins of the garden and this awareness of oneness, this awareness of who we've always been. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus prompts that. It, it sort of almost like jogs our memory. You know, he or on the cross, he, 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 we get a jolt. And, so, and, and it's from there that we, there's a journey into uh, beginning to understand who we've always been. So one of the uh, Garden of Eden, basic definition is bride of the bride of his pleasure. Mm -hmm. Garden meaning bride um, and Eden meaning pleasure. The concrete he Hebrew language, you know, takes um, uh, these, these pictures like, and, and it describes the function of it. So a garden, you put a seed in the garden, it'll produce fruit. So in the Hebrew language but then you know, the same the same picture is of a bride you put a seed in a bride then she'll produce offspring you know and that that's what the garden is or the function of the, of the bride is is to produce or to be fruitful and to multiply uh the, the eden means um means pleasure you know uh but it, there's a there's deeper meanings to what what eden is if i were to break down in the hebrew you know the word garden and uh, the word Eden, you know, the word garden means uh, a rising up or lifting up of life. Mm -hmm. So it's a garden bringing forth a tree that bears fruit. That's what, that's what garden is. And Eden means this, it's, it's a place where you open the door and enter into the pathway that leads to life. So if we're to put garden and Eden together, then it's a place or posture or a position in the spirit where we, be, where our, our, I guess our eye becomes single uh, mm -hmm. and it allows us to an, an eternally open door that reveals the ever eternal, eternal lifting up of life. Uh, that's yeah. a mouth right there. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you go. Yeah, you know, it, well, I mean, I'm enjoying this because uh, this has been one of the long-term studies that I have uh, been on this journey of of what happened from Genesis 1 to Genesis 2 in Adam 
And, you know, uh, I, I remember someone on a show one time said that Adam, uh, God put Adam to sleep and Adam never woke up. There's no scripture that says Adam woke up, but what woke up was the suke, the consciousness of man. And that was the knock on the head. And you know what I, I said about the cross? I said this in every religion, when they, no matter where, who it is, when they look at the cross, they see the crucifixion of Christ. You take, for example, uh, Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ. Uh, what a horrific uh, setting that was displayed in that. But, but here's the thing. Uh, I said that what the cross was, was like uh, an electrical shock to the mind of mankind. It got the attention of mankind to, uh, with the intent of waking man up. Now, isn't it amazing that the cross took place in the Greek in a place called uh, uh, Golgotha, uh, but in the Aramaic, it's called the place yeah. of the skull, That's the mind. Right. And so it's, yeah. so it's a symbolic or a metaphor of the mind and how God wanted to wake us. And I love what you said about that, you know, Adam having kind of a, a knock on the head. Well, that kind of produced that amnesiac state that mankind was birthed in. At least we've got ancestors that believe we were birthed in Adam's mind when re really we were birthed in the eternal Christ. Because when, when the Bible says in Luke that Christ, the, the, the uh, birth of Jesus took place on this wise, uh, the word birth there actually, if you trace it out, can end up saying origin. And so the origin of the birth or the creation or the manifestation of Christ was from before time began uh, in eternity past when God created all humankind. And so I just love that. Uh, so as we as we talk about this tonight, and I know there's a lot of things to go over, but um, you, you also said that um, uh, even David improves on it uh, and places uh, the Ark of the Covenant as we're talking about the Holy of Holies, because I love the Holy of Holies. Most people believe we came to God in the outer court, but we didn't. We were always in the Holy of Holies, but we have an yeah. outer court mentality sometimes. That's right. And, yeah. and so Adam, uh, I mean, David rather, had this, this concept also. And, and isn't it amazing that from Adam's what we call Adam's fall, all the way through the history of humanity, there is always uh, somebody trying to improve on what God, yeah. what God yeah. originally was trying to do. So we've got the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, we, we've got the Shekinah glory. We've got, uh, 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 and I love what you talked about in your write-up about David knew something that we are beginning to understand to be a greater degree, simply because now the Holy of Holies is within us and uh, is us, the abode of and dwelling uh, abiding place of god we are the garden the bride of eden pleasure and the bride of his pleasure david knew this and that's why he danced naked before god oh. because he entered back into the garden a state of mind a state of existence in the father this realm of face-to-face -face relationship with god so uh, go ahead and take this wherever you want to, because, you know, we used to study uh, the Garden of Eden and call it the hedge of protection, uh, but it was yeah. the hedge of pleasure. But as you yeah. said, there's a deeper meaning than that. And so when yeah. we look at this place being um, uh, not only pleasure, think about how many people in our generation, well, even in our parents and grandparents generation that lived in chaos, Live mm. without peace, without pleasure. And so yeah. now this awakening, this great awakening of understanding the Father's mind brings us back to a state of, or a mindset of pleasure and peace and all the mm. things that God is that we can experience. So please go ahead. Amen. And you, you notice that if you, we go back to, to the beginning, we see all the, all the patriarchs, you know, uh, having experiences with God. And all, and a lot of these experiences are on the tops of the mountains, um, yeah. and uh, you, you, and and there, there, there's key language that that is used. Things like the word "walk" in Amos three says, you know, how can two walk together unless they agree? And for me, a walk means symbolically or prophetically means to come into agreement with. And you see Enoch here walking with God. Well, where, where was he walking with God? Well, the scripture says back in the garden, it says the voice of the Lord God walked in the garden, in the cool of the 
in the spirit of the, of the day. And so for me, I, I'm seeing Enoch having an experience with God, walking with, with God in this place of what, what is called the, what I call the garden. You know, at the tops of the mountains, Abraham goes to Mount Moriah, has an experience with God. You know, um, Jacob wrestles with, you know, with this man or God, you know, that has a face-to-face -face experience, this panim, panim, face-to-face, -face, present in his presence experience. The same thing with Moses up the top of the mountain, God hides in the cleft, cleft of the rocks mm -hmm. uh, cleft and, and speaks to him face-to-face, -face, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when, when, when you see Moses uh, at the top of the mountain, God gives him a blueprint and he says, okay, I want you to go down and make me a tabernacle now. And in that tabernacle, I want to come down from the tops and I want to bring the tops of the mountain down and into, in, in, a, in and amidst my people. Yes. In, it was still behind a veil, you know. Uh, and the, the, the amazing thing is this, you know, we, we, in, what was knit within the veil were these cherubim. Yeah? And what was placed at, in, at the entrance of the garden? It was cherubim with a with a flaming sword. So for me, the Holy of Holies is a picture of the garden, you know, because in the midst of the garden you have this Ark of the Covenant with these with these cherubim that were covering a, a, a covering the box, the the, the mercy seat, and, and it says they were on either side of of, of the uh, the mercy seat. And for me, that's a picture of the tree of life. And so in the middle of this garden is this tree of life. Mm -hmm. you know? There's so many other different, you know, um, prophetic sort of revelations that you can get from that and understand. But for me, there was this place of meeting where where man and God can meet face to face. And now it is amongst the people, amongst the people. But David then, he betters that. He takes it to another level, mm -hmm. because he, he realizes, you know, here he is, um, you know, uh, he's just received the Ark of the Covenant back from the Philistines, you know. He goes and picks up the ark, and then all of these worshippers are going before the uh, before the cart. You know, Ohio and, uh, and Abinadad were on the back of the back of the cart, the horse in the cart, and the oxen stumble at, stumble at Nacon's threshing floor. Nacon means a place of preparation, and Uzzah reaches out to steady the ark, and, and Uzzah was breached. You know, there's a breakout, and for me, there's a, there's a prophetic picture in this too as well. So worship will draw the presence of God. It will draw him out of the heavens. It'll manifest him. But the thing is, you know, when we worship in spirit, you know, um, it, it, it's not enough to contain the manifestation of God, if I can say it that way. There has to be a worship in truth. And this is what, what I'm getting back to now is that there has to be a worship in this identity of, of, of the truth that what has always been. Mm -hmm. Identity. You know, and that's where that's where uh, I, I believe the the the, uh, the breach is. You know, Amos chapter nine verses eleven it says, "In that day, I'll rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I'll repair the breaches thereof." You know, David gets the ark of the covenant back to Jerusalem, and he pitches a tent and he puts the ark of the covenant in there, and the worshippers around the ark of the covenant twenty four hours a day, seven days a week for three for uh, uh, thirty six years, and. Uh, they were worshiping, and even even the sinners could see, you know, or the people on the outside, out, outside could see the Shekinah glory of God. And David danced naked like, um, like yeah. before. And it's a picture for for me. He he realized that he was back in the garden where he was naked again before the Lord. And that's what's happening, you know, is that we're realizing who we are. We're realizing our innocence. Because that's what nakedness is. It's a, it's a, we, we are innocent. We are blameless. The covering of the fig leaves is, is a covering up of shame. Is a covering of, you know, the passing of blame and the covering of shame uh, that, that Adam and Eve tried try to do. And so, and that's what we, that's what we've done. But God is unveiling that he's removing away, you know, the veil of, of um, the, our mistaken identity and yes. he's who we've always been and it's it, and now uh, the thing is instead of the treasure being you know the glory of god being on on top of a of an ark or the manifestation of that you know we're we're starting to see that hey he's placed it within us it's always been within us he's just been trying to show us and awaken us to that that we are now we are the temple of the living god we are the tabernacle of the living god and the holy spirit and it's in us 
that we are beginning to realize that the fullness of God exists. We've yeah. just got to manifest that by waking to our identities. I'll just throw it back to you. <laughs> I'll keep going otherwise. No, hey, good preaching, man. I mean, this is good. Uh, you know, and the amazing thing is, is that as people are awakening to truth, uh, we're beginning, to, I think one of the struggles are, um, uh, as we're reconnecting in our thinking back to the Father's mind, is that, okay, I'm getting a better picture of who God is. Okay, I get that he loves me unconditionally. He loves everybody else. I'm getting that. But my character, my behavior has not always been first rate. And so people will think that about themselves and they'll, they'll begin to think out of duality, which is separation. And that was Adam's problem. It was a, a psychological um, condition uh, I call separation anxiety. And it brought, it brought fear. It brought intimidation. It brought uh, the, the need to go hide um, and uh, all of that. But uh, I, I think I think that's what we do in terms of uh, we may not go into a, a jungle uh, and hide, but we'll not pray uh, or talk to God. Uh, we'll not get into the word and and, and meditate on 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 the, the truth of the of the original uh, manuscripts and and try to know more about. We just kind of avoid certain things. We avoid uh, attending church meetings or or um, uh, outings at the park where there's Christian bands doing worship. We try to avoid those things. In a sense, that is man's effort to hide in our modern uh, world. But the thing is, isn't it amazing that you know? I often say this if. If you could hide, um, uh, if Adam could hide in a, a concrete bunker or in a lead vault, you, you realize in a lead vault, even Superman uh, with his X-ray vision could not see into a lead vault. And, and so you take, you take God. There's no place that you can hide from God. The script, David said you can, you can be in the depths of, of Hadass, uh, Sheol, and uh, God would find you there. It's just literally a, a picture of how that you cannot hide from God. Why is that? Because you're eternally connected to your creator and you cannot disconnect. I mean, you know, isn't it amazing that uh, people think if I could just get all of the blood to get uh, suddenly be out of my body and, and live, then I wouldn't have to worry about blood contaminations and blood diseases. And, but you can't live without the blood in your human body. Well, uh, I, I like to think about it this way that uh, no matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing, you cannot hide from the creator. The creator and his creation are one. Here's the thing, the creation for most of our lives just didn't know it. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, let alone thinking that here you are in Australia, here I am in the, the literally in the Midwest. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about uh, how, how we're not disconnected but we're one as spirit beings and as the creation of God, even though we're uh, many, many miles apart. And so when you talked about the original mandate that God gave to Adam, which was to, uh, to uh, uh, re replenish the earth, um, uh, you know, what, what, is, what was the scripture when he said um, uh, for man to, um, I, I forget, I know my interpretation of it. Oh, he'd be fruitful and multiply. And I think that this term actually could be translated to say, be fruitful in, in your, uh, your awareness of understanding God and understanding you, and then multiply the mind of God to the whole earth. I don't think it ever was about a garden, planting more gardens, getting the garden all over the, I think it was just about uh, multiplying his mind. And that's really the mission we have today is to multiply the understanding of God's mind we've received to everybody else in the world. So, you know, all the way to this thing being the builder that the, the stone that the builders rejected um, mm -hmm. to all of that. There is so much that really does apply to this, but I'd like to hear more because I'm enjoying this tonight. Amen. Yeah. It's, it's like in it for me, it, it, just like that piano and accordion, you know, <laughs> just un, unfolding, but God it will the experience our, our sort of human 
uh, experience. Um, yeah. For us, he brings it all back together, you know, as we become more conscious of um, who we've always been. And so we begin to see then that, hey, there's an abiding, there's a tabernacle. You know, there's a there's a tabernacling that that occurs that if I that abiding in Him, uh, and right. I'm conscious of that, um, then I live in reality and I live in an awareness, a consciousness, awareness of what's always been and the isness of God, if I can put it that way. And so, like, and so He paints that many pictures. You know, He paints you know the picture of uh, He's the uh, Jesus the vine, we are the branches. He's the chief yeah. corner. And the capstone. We are the living stones. Uh, he's the bridegroom. We are the bride. He's the head. We're the body. He's the good shepherd. We're the sheep. You know, there's so many pictures of oneness, of this family, of this connectedness that we have to get a picture of. One, you know, one of those pictures, the vine and the branches, you know, is 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 a beautiful picture because it's it's you know it's easy to um, illustrate the life force of the eternal source that is God which is love and so being connected to the vine we get to produce fruit and that's the that's the um i guess a a part of our function is producing fruit but not only fruit the fruit has to come from the eternal source the realm of duality will always produce a temporal fruit it will come it won't it won't remain but the fruit of from an eternal source will remain it is love in in all of its essence and it will continue to flow flow and flow there's no there's there's no reverse cycle on that it just continues continually unflows for god so loved the world that he gave he continually gives and so um the the fruit that we produce you know this fruit of this consciousness you know uh, it's meant to cover the whole earth you know as the water's and see, so, uh, if I were to paint the picture of a fruit tree, um, you put a seed in the, in, in, in the ground, you know, that's not the fullness of full expression of that. The Hebrew word for glory is kabod. It means the full weighted expression uh, of, 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 of a seed, if I can say it that way. So it's the, you know, the seed in the ground isn't the full expression, even when it takes root so, and starts to get a, you know, a stem and, and produce leaves. That's not, not, that's not the full weight of that glory. Uh, but when it starts to grow up and become a tree and that tree produces fruit and that fruit ripen, that's when the, the, the glory of that tree you know, and that's what the, that, that's the full weight of it. But the, but it doesn't stop there. The nature of the seed within the fruit is eternal. It will continue to produce and produce and produce and reproduce after its own kind. And so the the glory that we that is that God has placed within us, and Scripture says this: Christ in us, the hope of glory. Galatians chapter three verses six and says that the seed is Christ. Uh, chapter eight verses uh, eleven says this: that the the seed is the word, the logos. You know, the Greek word for word seed is spiro. It's, it, it's the root word to sperm and sporos. It has reproductive qualities. So the nature of the seed is to continually reproduce and reproduce after its own kind. And then that nature is Christ. And that Christ is the hope of glory that's within us. So this the full weighted expression of the glory of God rests within us. And but it's the reality when we awaken to that reality that it it already is. Just as the seraphim that flew over the throne in Isaiah chapter six to see the whole earth was full of the glory. This is back in Isaiah six, so many, so many hundred years ago that the, they they got a picture of the fullness of the of the glory covering the whole earth. And for me, uh, I see the glory is is. Us, we are the earth that is is covering us. It's a people that are walking in who they have always been and yeah. walking in that awareness that we've always been like this. There was never, there was uh, never a time that we stopped becoming a son. But we, but the veil places, uh, you know, places the label on things. You know, he becomes the. The, you know, the prodigals, I know he becomes, you know, this son that, that steps out of, you know, and loses and loses the mind or loses their uh, and forgets who they are. But God never, never for one moment um, stopped knowing that that son was always a son. And that's the thing with us. 
is that we never lost our identity. <laughs> we just lost our mind. We, <laughs> we, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the amazing thing is this, is that what we've been looking for, just like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, yeah. has always been with us. We never lost it. And it was never, it was never with the wizard behind the curtain. It was never there. <laughs> yeah. He never had to show us that reality. We just, it, it was always with us. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's a lot of, uh, whether it's Hollywood or it's other things that paint a picture of concepts that maybe from their point of view, this could be what it's like. But uh, God always has a much greater picture uh, of uh, relationship than what mankind has conceived. Um, and, and, and so uh, I, I love this about uh, the mountain and about the meeting place. And you know, uh, I love what you said about Eden not uh, not being limited to a physical manifestation, um, but that it's actually a dimension in the spirit where we meet and tabernacle with the Father. Uh, this last week, uh, as I'm kind of wrapping up Revelation chapter 21, um, I'm looking at the, the the temple being God's temple. The Bible says that God will tabernacle, uh, but there's but there's a difference between the, the a temple. And a uh, and I think it's a tabernacle. There was two words that were in in conflict that didn't have the same meaning. Uh, but but what God tabernacles with His creation. Now here's the thing about Revelation 21 and 22. Uh, it is Isaiah's prophetic word saying that God declares the end from the beginning. And so what we've seen in the beginning, which has to be before Adam. So here's biblical evidence that before Adam, there had to be something that was concrete, that was solid in terms of relationship. There was no fall. There was no duality. There was no separation. And God says uh, in Revelation uh, uh, 21 that he, his, he tabernacles with man. Uh, I know some read it as he he makes he tab he he makes his tabernacle with man or that but but it's you know it, when we look at the modern translations of scripture and talk about what God will do uh, if you study them out oftentimes you'll find it's what God's saying that he has done and so we mm -hmm. see the end from the beginning we see God's heart was always to meet with his creation now back to Adam when Adam hides from God uh, in Genesis 3, uh, God comes on the scene and he says, Adam, where are you? Now, I'm, I am totally aware that God knew where Adam was. And I like that what you said, again, not only did Adam knock, get a knock on his head, uh, but, but lost his mind. Okay, mankind lost their mind. Uh, they weren't mm -hmm. thinking in the right mind. Uh, but when, when God says, where are you? Adam comes forth and says, I hid because I was naked. Now, here was God's response immediately. And I can just hear this conversation. Oh. Uh, in my uh, my supernatural imagination immediately mm. god says who told you that you mm. were naked in other words adam felt as if he was see physically he was naked but he felt as if he was stripped of something or that yeah. he had uh, uh taken on another direction uh, really another mind and God says, who told you that? Where did that lie come from? Well, the lie came from his own conscience. There was no, you know, we talk about the serpent. The serpent is metaphoric uh, for the, uh, the, 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 the spinal column and the, the nerve endings and that which speaks to the brain. But the consciousness of his mind said, you know what? I think I can actually be more than what I'm seeing myself as. And so we get to Isaiah 14 uh, I'm, uh, and we see where Adam uh, it wants to uh, be higher than God or above God. And he makes this effort. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I'm just so fascinated with, with all the way up to the point where Adam is for lack of better terms, and I know we'll get into this, kicked out of the garden, then there's a cherubim placed at the entrance, and all of that. Now, we're going to talk about that, but it's amazing that God didn't change his heart or his mind about his creation, even to that extreme. And sometimes, you know, when scripture says he turned people over to a reprobate mind, or it says that that he let them go their way, or to think, you know, what Paul so beautifully expresses this, it's not that God's saying, look, uh, God's not saying, just go your own way, do your own thing. It's that God's saying, you know what, if that's the choice you make for now, 
go ahead and do your thing, but I'm not going to let go of you. Uh, I'm not going to separate myself from you, no matter how hard you run in the opposite direction. And that's the beauty of this garden experience is mm -hmm. that God keeps pursuing his creation in in this way not in a works effort but in this way that he never left his creation the creation was never separated from god ever 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 and i just want to say to anybody watching tonight you know what there's nothing you can do to be separated from god it just won't work it just doesn't work so there, there isn't no need in trying to be separated from God. Don't operate out of a dualistic uh, mindset. Operate mm -hmm. out of the Christ mind that's in you. Talk to us some Amen. more. Amen. Yeah, and, and that's what I, uh, I see. You know, um, when when you, you bump your head, you start to see double. Mm -hmm. uh, and things can become blurry. Things can become vile or things, you know, and, and it's just like waking out, waking up out of a sleep. You know, it takes a little bit of time for the focus to come. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why our eyes have, have got to become single. You know, and not seeing it in duality. Uh, and so God is, is um, you know, everyone in their own sort of journey is coming to the is awakening, is 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 coming into this awareness where. Uh, just like what I, how I define the Garden of Eden, it's a place and a posture, a position where when, when our eye becomes single and unveils e the eternally open door, you know, it, the, the realm of heaven, you know, if, if, if you want to, if we want to put it that way, you know, it, it has never been closed. It's always been open, you know, and, and, and what it does, the, the nature of that realm, the kingdom of heaven, if I, if I can say it that way, is always looking to eternally lift up and bring forth life, to raise up yeah. life, bring forth fruit. That's what Eden is. You know, it also, it also means a, a spot and a moment, an open door in presence. So there's a place, you know, or posture uh, or an, uh, an attitude of, of where we have a conscious awareness of God's presence. Of, you know, because the, the garden is a place of face to face. The Holy of Holies is a place of face to face, the top of the mountain, the mountain of the Lord's house, the tabernacle, you know, whatever you have. You want to call it the all places of face-to-face -face relationship where we come into a consciousness of presence. The Hebrew word for face or a presence is panim. And when, when people like Jacob and, and Moses and that spoke to uh, God face-to-face, -face, it, 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 it says that they were um, speaking to him present to present or to be, and for me, I, I interpret that as being present in his presence or to become one, to be to totally in total conscious awareness of this realm of heaven who is the substance of God, which is love. And our and he continually flows out of that, you know. And so I, I, I see that, you know, this is what we meant. We are meant to be fruitful in, and to spread that and, and into all of the earth. And who's who's that? Is when when I have fellowship with my brothers and sisters, you know, it's it's bringing that duality into oneness. You know, I, I get to I get to bring heaven into their earth. You know. Amen. And to 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 be a part of the catalyst of, of their awakening, you know, God is you know, and God is using us all to to is just like a wildfire, just to spread and cover the whole earth, to fill the whole earth with His and not not to not not to um, you know go out and plant a physical garden, you know, throughout the whole earth until you know the Sahara Desert becomes a forest. No, it's, you know, it's got nothing to do with that. We are that forest. We are the trees of righteousness. Yeah. We planning of the Lord. We are the, you know, he's the vine. We are the branches. We are meant to be a fruitful vine. And God is bringing forth that fruit in and through us, you know. And that's what I, that's what I love about, you know, for me, the fruit opens the king. It opens heaven. It changes like, and I shared a, a couple of times back, a couple of shows back um, about, you know, being at um, the uh, airport here in Melbourne, um, and uh, this little kid was in front of me. He wanted an ice cream. He only had a dollar sixty cents for for two for two uh, for for a cone. 
and he wanted to get two cones. And so I placed 20 cents next to that dollar coin. And then the Macca's guy, I'll call him that, um, his eyes open up and it was like, it was the greatest thing he's ever seen. You know, it was just so, uh, so amazed. So amazed he was, was uh, that he gave me a free coffee. You know, so <laughs> thinking, you know, you were gonna stop this little kid from having two cones for 20 cents, you know, but you're giving me a $5 coffee. You know, you know what I mean? and so, but what flowed out of that was out of out of that was the kingdom, and I was able with that twenty cents was the kingdom flowing out in in the fruit of kindness, right? And what it did, it placed a demand on the kingdom in him, uh, and and he he is like he felt like he had to respond in some sort of way. And so he, and then I got, you know, an incredible, <laughs> you know, uh, an incredible blessing out of it, you know, by getting that overflow. But, but it spoke to something in him. And that's what, you know, we are meant to do is flow out of these fruit, out of the fruit of the spirit. For me, I see the 12 fruits, fruits of the spirit, you know, the 12 fruit on the, on the tree, the tree of life in the, in, in the garden, you know, uh, yeah. We are meant to manifest that and flow out of, you know, the sap that's in the root and into the fruit. Uh, that it, and it, it's people's prerogative to, you know, eat the fruit and spit out the seed. It's up to them if they want what's in the fruit that we present to them or that we give to them. But if the fruit is spoiled, yeah, if the fruit is not good, then they're not going to receive the seed. So, yeah. sorry back to you. Yeah. And, and 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 that's that's so beautiful because as we are awakening to this revelation of truth, uh, I remember growing up in uh, one of the three largest denominations in the world, a Pentecostal denomination, and I I remember that uh, we were taught that we were right, and mm -hmm. the other church down the road was wrong, mm -hmm. and and we were taught that our our doctrine about healing, our doctrine about Holy Spirit, our doctrine about all these things was the only right way and everybody else was just missing it. And isn't it amazing that we take that and then we move into the world and we watch people around us that are uh, have, uh, let's just say loose lifestyles or different lifestyles and we watch them and we begin to be uh, of the same mind of judgment uh, but but when the message of God's unconditional love begins awakened to us, begins within us, uh, then we begin to work toward, and I, I use word, the word work loosely because it's not supposed to be a labor intensive effort, but it's but more of a flowing in his mind. But we begin to see other people like the father. You know, for that to happen, we first got to see the father clearly, and then we've got to see ourselves as who uh, we really are. And when you get a good look at who you really are, you'll stop looking in the mirror and seeing your the reflection of all the, the your past and your failures and your mess ups. And you'll start seeing uh, the Christ mind from the Christ mind, you'll start seeing God in that reflection. And then in time, you begin to look at other people who could right, be right down uh, town uh, having a, an emotional outburst or, or um, you know, doing some, committing some crime. Uh, and you begin to see past the outward exterior and you begin to see the reflection of God in them. It's like the man who gave you uh, coffee. Uh, you, he, you know, the kingdom of God was activated in you that caused a reaction in him. Whether he considered himself to be a believer in Jesus or not is really immaterial because he's the creation of God. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm not, you know, for everybody watching and I'm not placing a yay or a nay on a, or a judgment on saying, you know, uh, go out and do your thing and whatever goes. And that's the way great. I'm not saying that at all. I believe in more responsibility, but what I am saying to you is we're going to have to quit looking at people like we think people should be and start looking at people the, uh, from the mind of the father. And when we do our perspective changes, you know, that's when we're able to love people in spite of our likes and dislikes, uh, cause we all have them. Amen. And, uh, and so that's when you begin to step back to the garden of pleasure, that experience 
that God always wanted. You know, again, it's not about a location. It's not about whether it was a real garden or not. It's about an experience. It's about an encounter. And one of the things I notice as we talk about uh, this place of meeting with God face to face, there is a term in the Passion Translation commentary uh, that uh, that speaks of not just face to face, but the translation in the Greek is face into face. Yeah, and, yeah. and meaning that we look through father's eyes and that we speak from his voice we think from his mm -hmm. mind because we are one so i see one when we talk about the city of god i see one massive city with many expressions in it and yeah. i just am so grateful that even when you read that the the, the temple there is the is uh, the lamb uh, i have no issue with that because the lamb and I are one. And so right. we're that same temple, that same expression of that same father. And this is such a beautiful thing uh, because the opening of the eyes becomes the door that gives us access into the garden. It's a, a walking in a conscious awareness state of life. Talk to us some more, my brother. Amen. And, and that's it. It's been for me personally, you know, it's been a huge, huge awakening, you know, to, to walk with a single eye, to mm -hmm. walk with the with the eye that is reflective of my father, you know. And I do that a lot in my workplace, you know, with, with my young people, you know, and you know, and they I don't need to say a word. I become the word, you know. The, mm. uh, I become the voice of the father for them. You know, I become uh, that voice that of healing for them. I become that voice of deliver. I become that which is need. You know, that which is needed for them in those moments, and they respond to that because they're drawn to it. You know, you, you catch more flies with sugar, you know, than vinegar. You know, they they they're drawn to that which is um, you know that which comes from the essence of the father. You know, and I. And I, you know, I just, uh, when I talk about, you know, the young people that I do work with, you know, they, and how, um, do, you know, it's those, we, we spoke about this the other day about those non-judgmental practices. And really it is, what, what it is, it's just flowing out of the tree that brings forth life, you know, or that, that comes from, that, that is life. You know, um, was it Matthew 7 that says, if, if, if we look through a, through a, a place of measurement, through, through eyes of judgment or duality, and we're measuring this with that, good versus evil, or with a measuring stick, you know, it's just, it's just a dead tree in our eyes. You know, it's a log. Mm -hmm. and, and people don't want that. They don't want to be judged. You know, they don't want to be told, uh, you know, uh, and, and have their... Um, the shortcomings and all and fallings and sins and disappointments all, all pointed out. They, they they don't want that. They 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 thrive under the gaze of a non-judgmental eye. Yes. You know, yes. Thrive under the light of the sun. You know, and it's like you know if we it's just like in the natural. You know, like like a a a, a seedling under the shade of a big tree. You know, it will move to where the sun is and so it'll be shaped by the sun and so and that's the thing if we're going around looking for the darkness and others and it can veil our own eyes you know, but when we look for the light in others mm -hmm. then the life of christ within us if it I, I i won't say that it grows because it's already in him you know that we, it is the fullness of maturity but what i'm saying is that we get to that becomes our experience you know we we start to walk in that walk into this uh, consciousness awareness of, of of life you know yes yes the, the light that we we give off the light that we shine is only because of uh, it only comes because of who, like you said, face into face, uh, is because of who we are looking through, whose eye we are looking through. And so Amen. I just, yeah, I'm just seeing it more and more, you know, and it's opening up to more and more. You know, I, I, you know, I love the people that I've walked with in past seasons, you know, the church that I've come out of, come out of you know, I love with all my heart all, all those people, you know, and, and they were a part of my journey. You know, you know, God has taken me into another journey, you know, and I, I will continue to walk in, you know, that light in life. But it is just that I've had to, 
I've had to step outside of that to, yeah. to grow to what he's called, you know, who he's calling me to be. And, you know, a, a tree will only be limited, you know, to, you know, the pot that it's in, you know, its growth will be stunted. A bonsai tree, uh, you know, it cannot grow any bigger than what its, what its constraints will allow. Mm -hmm. God is for, for me, he, he set me free. <laughs> he's setting, he, he's, he's breaking me out and I'm beginning to see, um, uh, see more clearly than I've ever seen before because I've broken outside of uh, the, the box of religion or the pot plant of religion, if I, if I can say it that way. Right, right. And I'm, 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 allow, I'm allowing the life of the spirit, the law of the spirit of life to flow in and through me more and more and more. And it's not to say that, you know, any... fellowship that I've been in before I've not like religious um, you know uh, issues in our lives but you know, I, I'm just saying for me my own personal journey is just breaking out and allowing the law of the spirit of life to flow freely through me yeah. amen so uh, before we're done tonight we were going to talk about the uh, and I don't know if we have a lot of time to do that but we were going to talk about the, uh, the the cherubim um that was at the guarding the entrance to the garden and um wow. you know there there's so much there uh yeah. that we probably won't get to tonight and and so we may have to do that another show but it isn't it amazing um that revelation shows us that uh and i i, I want to save time and not get into a bunch of uh, greek and hebrew definitions tonight um mm -hmm. but give you the, the last part of the show here um, isn't it amazing that what we have construed as uh, God kicking Adam and Eve out of the garden, uh, in the Hebrew language, it was really that God was trying to pull them out of the wrong identity of, of, of uh, this fallen mindset and guide them back to the tree of life. Because when we talk about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it literally is the striving to do good or to do evil, or to judge other people who are, oh man, they're doing a good job, or over there, man, they're, they're really messing up, mm -hmm. and it's a type of the arm of the flesh for me, um, yeah. I've heard people preach a lot of things about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or even about the tree of life, and I just believe that Jesus, uh, the eternal Christ, is the tree of life, and the path to the tree of life is always open, because you're, you're, uh, um, uh, eternally connected to your creator so you can't get away from god so uh, so take us wherever you'd like to in these last few minutes i don't even care if we go a little over but whatever works for you amen yeah uh the cherubim yeah when joshua came over jordan and he met you know, i think it's joshua five he met the captain of the lord of hosts and you know, had his sword drawn and um and Joshua came to me, and this is what Joshua says to him, are you for me or for my adversaries? And for me, it, it was spe he's speaking out of a realm of duality. You know, uh, are you good, are you for good or for evil? You know, um, and, but the Captain Lord of Hosts says, neither. <laughs> mm -hmm. He says, I'm not for that tree. <laughs> here, I'm here to keep the way to the tree of life. He says, take, and there is a picture, you know, of the top of the mountain, if I can put it that way, uh, of, of the tabernacle, of the garden, of, you know, it's a meeting place of God, the tent of meeting here, where there's, you have this cherubim of this, um, the captain of the Lord of hosts, you can call it what you will, but he was keeping the way to, to the life. Why? Because he says to him, take the shoes from off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. He was in the holy place. And it's, the, and, and it's a, it's a, what he was saying is get rid of this duality or this way, dual way of thinking. Okay. I've got a sword drawn and this sword is going to take your head off. You're going to get a check up from the neck up and, and we get rid of your stinking thinking, you know, <laughs> <laughs> if I, and so um, the cherubim for me is the, is the law of the spirit of life. And it has this, um, uh, ability of the, the it's part of his nature is to or his function and nature is um to to not 
uh, is to is to cover life, is to protect the life that was that is within us, which is the Christ, the Christ seed, mm. and duality is not allowed <laughs> in that. The realm of duality, you know, good versus evil. So, you know, I'm not for you. It's just like the elections, you know, before Trump or before Biden. He's sort of, no, God is for him. For him. <laughs> you know, it's about him. It doesn't matter. See, see, it doesn't matter who's sitting on in the government. He's still sitting on the throne. And he, his life still rules. He's sovereign, you know. And so... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to unpack the cherubim more, <coughs> um, but I, I just realized the time. And but I, I just love that um, you know um, what we're seeing more and more is that God is opening up to us this garden that has always been, and we're beginning to our eyes, the veils and the scales are being removed from our eyes to see and to walk in a realm of consciousness that reflects our own identity and the identity that we've always been back to us, that mm. we've always been, you know, and we get to take that. We get to take that and to be fruitful and multiply and fill the whole earth with it. That's what I love about this, you know, I can, I'm face to face with God pushing the, pushing the trolley down the shopping aisle. You know, I'm in the hole, my shoes off, <laughs> off my feet, you know, and I'm walking in the presence of God and speaking face into face with him and people around me are being affected by the presence of God because they feel the love that's flowing from that tree that gives life. Amen. And, and that's what's so beautiful about life is that uh, we can live in this dimension that we know. We, because because knowing is greater than feeling we, we don't have to feel it although when we can feel it it's really cool but knowing is greater than feeling and when we know that we walk with god in an unbroken unity it's not like i get up in the morning and i gotta say good morning lord because i just yeah. met him for the first time today or i gotta say good night and if you if a person practices that hey go for it uh i don't size at all but i'm just saying that this a awareness of a constant uh presence of god presence means to be in the presence of or to be mm -hmm. present with someone and so that's what his presence is you don't invite invite god's presence because you live in uh it, with an ever-present god so uh we appreciate everybody watching this and i'll tell you what we're gonna have to come back again and it's gonna be after the first of the year i'm booked up till the end of the year but uh, we're going to have to come back and do another one-on-one -on -one and talk more about the the, the exit of the garden and uh, just some things that went on there because there's so much misunderstanding about uh, when God talks about the serpent will crawl on his belly and eat dust all the days of his life and what the serpent mind is and, and what the dust represents and all of that. There's a lot to be unpacked there but uh we'll come back and do this another time uh because i i knew tonight i i have more notes from between the two of us for this show than i usually do for any show and uh i knew we Amen. weren't gonna get through it all but um we'll come back and yeah it'll be cool i appreciate yeah, just a, just quickly on that that serpent is eat, eat the dust you know on the on his belly it should go and it just it's almost like the, the mirror of, you know, out of your belly shall flow rivers, living water. And so the life that comes out of God is, is, you know, the death, you know, the death that comes out of the serpent, you know, that yeah. which you, what you feed on whatever well you drink from will, will determine what is produced. Yeah. I'll just leave it with that. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and so good. We, you, you, I think it's important to be careful what well you drink out of. Yeah. And I'm not telling you where to go to church. I'm not telling you what TV, uh, Christian TV program to turn on. Yeah. I'm not telling you none of that. But I'm just telling you that eating, eating and drinking from the right source is absolutely Amen. important. So, hey, brother, I appreciate you so much. Apostle Josh, you can see him again on Tuesday night with us. Um, I just appreciate you so much, man. And I just, uh, uh, you know, I just, it's, it's amazing how many connections you can make in this world. But it's also amazing when you make a, a divine connection. That's just the right connection. That's how I feel about you. 
Appreciate you so much. Me too. Bless you. Amen. Hey, everybody, if you would click like and share, and uh, we will get back with you uh, on our next show in the morning, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. Evangelist Brett Hart will be with me. Uh, Brett Hart. Brett, um, I got Josh Hart on my mind. Uh, Brett Erickson will be with me as we continue our discussion in part two. It's so good, so rich. We're just getting into a lot of stuff. So we'll see everybody next time. Have a great night, unless it's morning where you are in Australia and other places. Have a great day and we'll see everybody soon don't forget to click like and share and we'll see you next time good night everyone bye-bye bye, -bye. Yes. Good night. <laughs>